And we are a Bible-based church, and so I want to read a passage of Scripture to you today as we get into part three of Q&A. We wrap it up, and then uh, next week, I'll tell you in a minute what we're going to start next week. But I want to read to you a passage from the book of Hebrews. I'm reading through the New Testament. My goal is to read it, New Testament, four times this year. And uh, the writer of Hebrews says this in chapter four, for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing even to the point of dividing soul and spirit and joints from marrow. This is the scary part. It is able to judge the desires and thoughts of the heart. It knows your motives, even if you don't. And no creature is hidden from God, but everything is naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must render an account. And the image there is of your neck being laid bare before a guillotine. Um, We are more sinful than we dare believe. But he goes on. He goes on. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, and this is the invitation to every single one of us, therefore, Let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace whenever we need help. So not only are we more sinful than we dare believe, we are also more loved than we can ever imagine. Let's pray. God, help us today as we answer some really difficult questions. Some nerves might be struck and some emotions might surface. Um, But God, in the midst of that, help us to think clearly. Um, And God, give me grace. Let my words be filled with both truth and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So next week, we're going to start a series that's really all about the, uh, the basics of the Christian faith. I'm calling it Coexist, but with a question mark understanding the basic of Christianity. And this is not a series where I'm going to bash on other religions. As a Christian, I am compelled to respect and love everyone, no matter what. But I do want to, in understanding the basic of of Christianity, I want to put Christianity up against different religions on different subjects and different issues. We won't be exhaustive in these other religions, but we will try to understand what are the essential, foundational, basic beliefs that Christians must agree on and have in common. A lot of the questions I got over the last three weeks, we could really say, hey, this is not a hill to die on, uh, but Christians disagree, and that's okay. But these other issues that we'll be covering will be issues that men and women, especially for the first 300 years of the church, literally died and gave their lives. They died on those hills, and they have preserved those doctrines and God's word Um, for us to look back on and to study and appreciate. Um, So with that, let's jump into the first question. This one has to do with purgatory. Is there a purgatory? And if so, who goes there and for how long? Now, purgatory, if you're not familiar with it, is the belief that when a person dies, he or she is not yet completely sanctified. That is made holy. To be sanctified is to be made holy. We are all in the process of that as Christians. Um, But essentially, purgatory gives someone more time, especially to work off what they call venial sins or sins that are not so serious. And so the Roman Catholic Church distinguishes between what they call venial, not so serious sins, and mortal sins. And mortal sins are defined by three distinctives that must all be present uh, when that sin is committed. First of all, that sin must be a grave matter, means serious. Uh, They are committing that sin with full knowledge, and they are giving deliberate consent. Now, 
I don't believe in purgatory. Let me explain why. Um, I think purgatory and separating venial from mortal sins is looking at sin from a human perspective. And certainly, murder is worse than hatred from a human perspective, a societal perspective. But you remember when Jesus came along in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you have heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I tell you, if you hate someone, it is as if you have committed murder. And so Jesus goes deeper and more serious when it comes to sin. He also said, you have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you even look at a woman in lust, it is as if you have committed adultery with her. And so I don't think Scripture separates sin into venial or mortal. I think all sin is mortal from God's perspective. Now, think about this. It also goes completely against the contrary, or completely contrary to the doctrine of grace. Romans 5, 8 says, God loves us while we were still sinners. He loves you as you are, not as you ought to be. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, maybe the most clear passage on how we become saved, how we get to heaven. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. In other words, you can't save yourself. It is a gift of God. It is not from works, so that no one can boast. So that no one can boast. So that puts the most serious, murderous, rapist in the same category as anyone else. Sin separates us from God. And we are saved not by our own works, not by our own effort. In fact, that is what separates the gospel from every other religious belief, religious institution, philosophy. We cannot save ourselves. Every other religion, you are saving yourself. And so purgatory, in my mind, which came around in, uh, in the, about the 4th century, was this misunderstanding of sin, and it was a misunderstanding of how we get to heaven in the work of Christ on the cross. And so it was an extension, more time for some, especially if you were not a monk or clergy. You needed more time to work off your sin and work through the process of sanctification. Um, and... To say that um, we must suffer for our sins in any sense is to say that the suffering of Jesus was insufficient. And that goes absolutely contrary to the gospel. And so, in short, when we die, we are entering eternity with God or forever separated from God. Paul says in 2 Th Thessalonians, he's talking about, a little bit about this issue, and he's talking about people who will reject the grace of God, walk away, turn their back on God. He says, they will undergo the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of God. You want to know what hell is? Paul just described it, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his strength. Question two, this is a hot topic in our culture today, and it is literally separating churches and families. Here's the question. I'm constantly asked about homosexuality and do I believe they all go to hell and why can you do something horrible and ask Jesus for forgiveness and go to heaven? Now, there's a question underneath the question there. Uh, I'll address homosexuality in a sec, but let's talk about the question beneath the question. Um, and it has to do with salvation. Who, who goes to heaven? And let me say emphatically, doing bad things does not send you to hell. Nor does doing good things send you to heaven. It goes against what I just talked about and, and the gospel. We are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God. It's something that only can be received. It's not something we earn or perform for. We are saved by grace through faith. And so, with that in mind, I want to try to be very clear here. This is a subject, homosexuality, LGBTQ, all that stuff I have been studying in depth for 35 years. 
I've looked at it from a theological perspective, a societal, cultural, biological, physiological, psychological, all different perspectives. And I want to be clear in talking about the subject. Now, I've addressed this before in church. You can go on our website and look in the past as, as I've addressed it. And I will address it again in a few months in our Coexist series. People are not issues to deal with. There are people to be loved and respected, no matter what. That is our calling as Christians. Um, and so with that in mind, being gay, in other words, having same-sex attraction, is not a sin. It is having sex, same-sex, or heterosexual sex or any kind of sex that is outside of the confines of the covenant relationship between a man and a woman. Being gay, even committing sexual acts, same-sex sexual acts, are not unforgivable. And so, let me give you three points, and I can't get into this too much. Let me invite you, if you have questions, if you need more information, you want to talk more about this, I, I will sit down and talk for hours if you like. Um, and by the way, there's a great podcast or YouTube, a webpage. You can go to Theology in the Raw. Preston Sprinkle has been dealing with this for years, and uh, I love the way he deals with it. He actually helps churches become more welcoming to LGBTQ+, um, without compromising what I'm saying about Scripture. Three things, three things I want to point out as to, um, on this issue of same-sex behavior and marriage. First of all, whenever marriage is mentioned in Scripture, it is always, every single time, between a man and a woman. There is no example of marriage, same-sex marriage in Scripture. Secondly, whenever same-sex relations are mentioned, they are always prohibited, condemned, or described as sin. And then thirdly, and this is more historical uh, than scriptural, this particular issue, churches from every conceivable background have agreed on, whether they be South American churches, Asian, African, Pacific Islanders, Coptic Christian, Orthodox Christian, Syrian Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Charismatic, non-Charismatic, Reformed, Wesleyan, and some of those terms mean nothing to you, that's okay. Um, they have all agreed. And what's interesting is there are very few issues that they have agreed on. But they've all agreed on this one, that marriage is between a man and a woman. Now, the Roman Catholic Church two years ago said this, um, God cannot bless sin. But last month, and you might be familiar with this, it was in the news, the Pope came out and said that priests can now approve and bless same-sex couples, but they cannot bless same-sex marriage. Now, that really confuses things in my mind. Let me close this question with this scripture. 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is talking about sexual purity. He's talking to a highly sexualized culture that worship sex and worship the goddess of sex. And he said this, Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, and by the way, sexually immoral is a term that's used a lot throughout Scripture, and it's all-encompassing of anything outside of the confines of a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. He says, Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have men, uh, sex with men, nor thieves nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And in the context there, he's talking about practicing that, not just, you know, stumbling, not committing a sin, uh, but a, a consistent practice of these sins. And then this next line is so powerful. Listen to what he says. And that, he, uh, that description of all those sins, and that is what some of you were. Past tense, what some of you were. <laughs> Think about that. That could describe this church. 
whatever the sin was. And Paul doesn't distinguish some sins as more egregious than others. While we tend to do that, he puts the greedy in the same bucket with the homosexual. Both are in need of God's grace and God's forgiveness. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And God's people said, Amen. Third question. What happened eternally to people that died before Jesus? And what about the people who never hear the name of Jesus? And then this person had some scripture, Acts chapter 14. Let me read part of Acts chapter 14 to you because Paul and Barnabas had just preached in a city named Lycona and they went nuts. They did some healings and they went absolutely mad. They were overwhelmed with what was going on. Listen to what uh, is described in the book of Acts. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus in that town, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas. When Paul and Barnabas learned about this, heard about it, they tore their clothes and they rushed into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all the nations go their way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. So while he let the nations go their way, he did not leave them without a testimony of himself. He has shown kindness. Again, this, this is, applies today anywhere in the world, any religion, any philosophy. He has shown his kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops for their seasons. And he provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. See, what Paul is talking about, that, about is what theologians call common grace. God has given common grace to all people no matter what, even people who eventually will reject him completely and be separated from God. While they are on this earth, they are given common grace by the rain, the seasons, the crops, the food, the joy. Now, let me follow that up with another passage in the New Testament, uh, also Romans chapter 1. Paul says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness, godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. In other words, the truth is there, it's been made known to them, but they suppress it by their wicked behaviors. And their wicked behavior follows their wicked beliefs. Since that may be known, since what may be known about God is plain to them, whoa, 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 let me read that again. What may be known about God has been made plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So in other words, there may be someone who never hears the name of Jesus, never hears the gospel, never has a Bible to read, but because of the things that are made, this universe, this creation, this world that we live in, they are, their eyes can be opened by God to where they can see his true nature, his invisible qualities. So here, in other words, they will be without excuse when they stand before God. And I, I like to describe it this way. No one in heaven will think, I deserve to be here. And no one will hell will think, I don't deserve to be here. Abraham, Moses, and David, these were Old Testament saints. They never heard the name of Jesus. They never heard the gospel in the sense that you and I have heard it, but they still heard it. And they were saved in the same way people today after Christ are saved. 
They looked ahead to what God might do to provide a way of salvation. We look back to the cross. And so it, is, it was the same for them as it was for us. We are saved by grace through faith. Number four, Whew. buckle up, this is a hot one. This was in the news. This was the title of the news clip, and I'll read it to you. Uh, Evangelicals now back Trump's statement that he was ordained by God to lead the U.S. Are we evangelicals? So, let, let's talk about minute, what it means to be ordained. It means to be chosen by God for something. And the scriptures are clear. I'm going to give you three scriptures are clear. That all authority on earth, good, bad, evil, doesn't matter are put there, ordained by God. So there is a sense in which President Biden is ordained by God. He was chosen, he was elected, he was ordained by God. God allowed it. So, did, so is Putin. Every world leader, in a sense, is ordained by God. Now let me give you some scripture. Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. By the way, think back to first century context. Roman Empire, Caesar, killing Christians left and right. Evil, evil people. Let everyone be subject to them. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. Be careful what you say about elected officials. You can disagree. You can disagree strongly. Be careful what you say about elected officials. Um, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Paul says to Timothy, I urge you, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved. Have you prayed for your government leaders, your political leaders, as much as you've complained about them? 1 Peter chapter 2, thank you for that honesty. 1 Peter chapter 2, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, and that is so critical, we need to see ourselves as Christians, as exiles, foreigners. This world is not ours. So, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among pagans, that is, non-Christians. That though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and maybe glorify God on the day that he visits us. Submit yourself to, for the Lord's sake, so we are submitting for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Whether the emperor as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. heavy. Um, let me talk about what evangelical are. There is a sense in which we are. This church is evangelical. Um, an evangelical is defined by four things. Let me explain those four things. First of all, evangelicals recognize the Bible as the ultimate authority. Not a person, not the Vatican, uh, not a church, not a religion, but the scriptures. And so, I welcome um, challenging me, questioning me. I don't always get it right. I do my best to. But ultimately, I am not the authority. God's word is. Secondly, evangelicals emphasize the work of Jesus' crucifixion and human salvation. We believe Jesus died, rose again from the dead, and will come again. And apart from his death and resurrection, there is no salvation for us. Thirdly, we believe that uh, Christians have a born-again experience. Though that born-again experience might be very different and diverse individually. Jesus told 
one of the most upright, religious, following the law people, you need to be born again. Being born again is not just for down and outers, it's for up and outers, it's for anyone. But that born again experience might look very different. Some people have high emotions and see a, a very dramatic shift and change in their life. Others, it's not so emotional, it's not so dramatic, and it's more of a slow process over time. Let me give you two examples in Scripture. When Paul was on, his name was Saul at the time, he was on the road to Damascus to put Christians in prison and may perhaps have them killed. What happened to him? Bright light, knocked on his can, was blinded. Meanwhile, right after the resurrection, a guy named Cleopas and someone else, some people think his wife, were on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus joins them, and they have no idea, the idea at the time that it's the resurrected Jesus. And for hours they walk, I think it's like a four-hour walk, and he goes through the, the scriptures over and over and over that were about him. And it wasn't until they invited him to his house and say, please come have a meal with us. Very, very typical Middle Eastern hospitality. And when Jesus broke bread and prayed and gave thanks, their eyes were opened. It's interesting. Paul was blinded. Their eyes were opened. Very different way of coming to salvation and faith in Christ. And the fourth one is maybe the most complicated or where it becomes more divisive. And that is evangelicals believe that we must be active socially in reforming society. Now, people will disagree on what that means and what that looks like. Some people, it means you need to form a coalition and vote. And if you just get the right guy in the White House, then that will save our country. Um, I won't go there. Never mind. Um, some people think it's going down to housing matters or you, United Churches. Uh, that's not the name, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, and volunteering. Some people think it's loving your neighbors. Some people think it's visiting the sick. And, 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 and all of that is true to some degree, but it is about active faith in loving our neighbor. And through loving our neighbor, and that's the key, society can be reformed. But like all organizations, like all movements, they tend to drift from its original mission. And they become more about protecting itself, forgetting what its mission is. In America, you go back into the 1800s, uh, you have the leftover of the Enlightenment from the 1700s, and Christians were being challenged, Scripture was being questioned, which is not a bad thing, and a lot of people were moving away. In fact, a lot of our church, uh, uh, country's founding fathers were deists, and so there's movement away from biblical Christianity. And so they got together, many de denominations, and they said, what are essential, what do we need to believe in? And it began the movement that they called not by them, but by outsiders as fundamentalism. It was a focus on the fundamentals, a return to the fundamentals. But fundamentalism became a bad word. It can became a dirty word, and so they stopped using that term. And it was probably about the 70s when the term evangelicals came into being. And they had these four basic tenets. This is what it means to be evangelical. Evangelicals becoming a dirty name in our world today, in our culture especially. And so I'm kind of curious what's going to happen moving forward. But here's the thing. Evangelicals are not defined by church building or denomination. In fact, there are many mainline denominations. When I say mainline, I'm talking about Presbyterian, Lutheran, um, uh, uh, Congregational, Methodist, all of these. Those denominations since 1962 have not only been on the decline, are splitting primarily over the authority of Scripture. Are miracles really miracles, or are they just metaphors to tell us a story? And now this issue, or not this issue, but uh, mainly the LGBTQ issue. Um, and so I am a conservative theologically. That doesn't necessarily line up all the time with conservative politics, um, but churches, mainline churches especially, and the Catholics kind of split in half when it, where it falls politically, and tends to be liberal. Um, but what's interesting is, is that mainline churches, liberal theologically, churches not, not politically, but theologically, have been on the decline, while conservative churches have been mainly on the rise, especially in Africa, 
in Asia and South America. It's exploding in those countries. Africa, they think, in about 30 years will be 50% Christian. You don't hear about this stuff in the news because it's not important to those who give the news, but evangelicals historically have been one of the most broad uh, umbrellas that share affinity with many, many, many different types of Christians. You can be a Catholic and evangelical. You can be Orthodox and evangelical. And it is not defined, like I said, by a denominational title or a building or a hierarchy, uh, language, culture, or skin color. Um, so I hope that is helpful to you as you think about that issue. Next question. A friend of mine refuses Christianity because she can't believe in a God who would send a baby to hell because he hasn't accepted Jesus. How can I best respond to her? Now, there's no evidence in Scripture that babies go to hell. In fact, I think it's a misunderstanding of original sin. Um, uh, it was about the 4th century when the church started baptizing infants, and there was a high infant mortality rate, and there was this idea that you know, you're born in sin, which is true. Uh, we don't, we, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And so if, they're, if you're born a sinner, then we got to christen them. We got to make them Christians. We got to baptize them so that they go to heaven. I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of baptism, of sin, and of salvation. Um, in Scripture, the only time you see someone baptized is after they believe. Now, there's two problems with this idea that babies go to hell. Number one, they don't. Number two, baptism never saves someone. Now, I'm not against baptism for infants, so long as the parents understand that does, does, that does not make their child a baptism. Each individual must be born again on their own. And we've talked about that. But let me give you an example in Scripture of where I, I'm... 100% certain that there will be babies in heaven who die in this life. I don't know if there'll be babies when we get there, uh, but they died in this life as an infant. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with David's story. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, had her husband killed. I think he broke six of the com Ten Commandments in, in that act. Um, but when he was made aware by Nathan, the prophet, um, the consequences of his sin, being the king, were serious. That baby was going to die. And for the next 10 days, David fasted. He put ashes on his head to show his grief, and he wept for 10 days. And then the baby died. Now, David's attendants were panicked because they thought, man, if he was that upset when the baby was still alive, how is he going to respond now that he finds out that this baby is dead? But when he found out, David got up, he bathed, cleaned, and went and had a meal. And they were like, whoa, what's going on here? And this is what David said to him when they asked him. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back? There is no reincarnation. I will go to him. Listen to it. David says, I will go to him, but he cannot return to me. So David had a fundamental understanding that when a baby dies, they are with God. Because David knew that one day he would be with God. So any child that has died before they can understand the gospel, before they are at a level psychologically, mentally, emotionally, where they can respond to it, or any baby that's been aborted, I believe will be in heaven. Final question. Did Jesus ever experience fear? Christians will disagree on this, but let me read to you one of my favorite parts of Scripture. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Deeply distressed and troubled. Hold on to that word, troubled, there. He says, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. 
And he said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, that the hour might pass from him. And he cried like this, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will be done. Now, the word troubled there is the word adamaneo, adamoneo, adamoneo. Say that with me, adamoneo. Now you learn Greek. It literally means to feel fear, to have a lack of courage, to be distressed and troubled. And we know from other scriptures, other gospels, that Jesus was so distressed that he began to sweat drops of blood. And so I think this speaks to the humanity of Jesus. He knew what was coming up and being limited to some degree in human flesh, he experienced all the emotions that you and I experienced, yet without sin. Like I read at the beginning, we have a God who can sympathize with us because he's been in your shoes. The only thing he can understand is, is giving in to sin. He never gave in to sin. But when he went to the cross, and that's important, he says, take this cup for me. And that cup is a, is a metaphor, if you will, of the wrath of God. And Jesus, who was also God, had never experienced separation from his heavenly Father. For all eternity, he has existed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet, a few moments later, he would hang on the cross and he would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's why he was afraid. Not of the physical torture and the pain, but that God would turn his back on him and he would take on our sin so that you and I could be set free from our sin. Let's pray. Father, thank you. God, that blows my mind away every time I think about it. And so, God, this morning as we take this cup, the juice that represents your blood, the wafer that represents your body, you were forsaken so that we would not be, so that we could be welcomed as your beloved children and live all eternity with you. And God, if that, if that has never been understood by anyone in this room, God, let it be understood at this moment that they are a sinner in need of your grace and you are extending that invitation to them right now god help them believe help their unbelief and help them step into eternity as a beloved child of god maybe even in this moment right now we pray these things in jesus name amen